Thank you all for joining us. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesbys. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, I'm happy to welcome all the people who braved what is hopefully the last snowstorm for the year uh, and made it to our, our uh, building. And it's actually really nice to see such a full room. Uh, it's been a long time since we've seen such a full room. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome all the people who are joining us online. Uh, and um, uh, before we get started, I just want to offer a special welcome to anyone who may be joining us for the first time. Um, if you're unfamiliar with MHS, uh, we are an independent nonprofit organization. Uh, we maintain a fantastic research library. Um, we host a wide variety of programs uh, on a variety of subjects related to Massachusetts and American history. Uh, this is just a sample of the programs that we host. Um, and we're only able to produce all these programs thanks to the support and donations of our members uh, and donors. And we hope that if you enjoy our programs, you'll consider becoming a member or a supporter of MHS. Uh, this evening, we'll hear from Roger Lowenstein on his new book, Ways and Means, uh, Lincoln and His Cabinet and the Financing of the Civil War. This work reveals the largely untold story of how Lincoln used the urgency of the Civil War to transform a union of states into a nation. Through a financial lens, he explores how the Second American Revolution, led by Lincoln, his cabinet, and a Congress studded with towering statesmen, uh, changed the direction of the country and established a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, it's a great book that was recently reviewed by both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, um, and we have copies available uh, at the end of the program. Um, our speaker this evening, Mr. Lowenstein, um, is a reporter and author. He reported for the Wall Street Journal for more than a decade, and his work has appeared on, uh, in Bloomberg, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Fortune, Atlantic, and many other publications. He has published seven books, including the New York Times bestsellers Buffett, When Genius Failed, and The End of Wall Street. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Roger Lowenstein. Gavin, uh, and thank you to the Massachusetts Historical Society. I want to thank my fellow uh, member, uh, Janet Sloven, who's also my uh, mother-in-law, who's been urging me to come to the MHS for uh, a long time. She didn't know it would take me five years to write a book to finally get here, but um, here I am. I wanted to thank people for coming out and braving the snow. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the 120 people who registered online for not going out and staying home. That's exactly where you should uh, be tonight. Um, talk tonight about uh, some about the North, some about the South, and a little bit about what we've all been living through the last couple of weeks. I've been thinking uh, a lot about what I'll call um, two self-destructive commodity empires. Uh, we've all been reading about and living through uh, what Vladimir Putin has been doing in the Ukraine and how he's tried to use um, uh, his energy cartel to intimidate uh, the West and to frighten it um, uh, out of responding. Uh, I think we're beginning to see that maybe Putin overreached. That Putin has overreached a little uh, uh, in assuming what that uh, cartel can accomplish. Uh, regardless of what happens in the shooting war, it looks like Russia is gonna be significantly cut off from the world economy for, I think, facing a very serious uh, depression, uh, economic depression. 160 years ago, uh, the councils of Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy were uh, just as isolated as Putin seemed to be today. Uh, the Southern Confederacy also had a cartel, a uh, cotton cartel, and cotton was a very big deal then. Cotton was really the first industry in the Industrial Revolution. There were probably a million people who counted for, on cotton for their jobs. Uh, some of them quite close to here in Lynn and Lawrence and the mill cities in New England, quite a few in Lyon in France, and, um, and the most like Shire in the, the manufacturing districts of, of England. And um, South uh, was absolutely, uh, I guess, this cartel uh, gave them. Uh, there was evidence of this in um, 1858, a couple of years before the Civil War started. Uh, James Hammond, senator from South Carolina, went onto the Senate floor and said, uh, later now it's quite famous, uh, 
no one dares lay a hand in the South, cotton is king. Two years later, Lincoln was elected in South Carolina, of course, was the first to succeed. Uh, dancing in the streets of, of Charleston, they thought that the story of the rebellion was over, not just beginning, that it was a, a fait accompli. Uh, as a local writer said uh, later, uh, war was far into the original plan. Uh, there was a unionist still, uh, one of the few unionists remaining in Charleston, a different comment. Uh, he said of his state that it was uh, too small for a republic, uh, but alas, too large for an insane asylum. Um, <laughs> General Sherman, who was stationed in Louisiana, said something similar as the other cotton states seceded. He just said men here have ceased to reason. Uh, the war was declared. The Confederate Secretary of War, uh, Leroy Pope Walker, said that if any blood, if any blood were shed, he would clean it with his handkerchief. So, so deluded was the South that um, when the war started, Jefferson Davis and his cabinet rejected the urgent appeal of Judah Benjamin, who was the attorney general that had shipped uh, a good supply of cotton to England where it could finance if needed a long war. Because that wouldn't be necessary because there wasn't gonna be a long war. In fact, um, they came up with a counter plan, which was just nothing sort of daft they decided to embargo their own cotton. Cotton was their only source of hard uh, currency, the only way they could buy arms and, uh, uh, and, and whatever else they needed from Europe, which was just about everything. They had no manufacturing of their own. Their plan was, or their idea was, that once England and France uh, were bereft of cotton, they would intervene uh, and, uh, and stop the war. Uh, they never even bothered to sort of think about, well, how would that work? How would England and France across the ocean uh, decide, uh, effectuate a, a ceasefire if they so desired. Um, it was, of course, a colossal miscalculation. As with Putin's miscalculation, uh, the Southern um, delusion, I think, occurred from a kind of myopia that grows up in, um, in areas in isolation or in communities in isolation. And the South really was isolated. They had a um, and seeing the world. Uh, to the South, the North was weak. The North was weak because they had a current uh, uh, conflict in, la in their labor relations between workers and industrialists, whereas the South, as it construed it, uh, had a harmonious system of labor, slavery, because of course the slaves didn't do anything about it. And I think Putin was also living under a delusion about the West. Uh, that we were weak. Democracies, we suffered from the inevitable dissent and um, inefficiency. What they missed was that democracies also have a great strength. Uh, they have a strength ultimately of, of the support of their people. Now, the South uh, in form was a democracy too, if you were white, but uh, secession wasn't a popular movement. It wasn't really a democratic movement. With the exception of Texas, and that was only at the insistence of Sam Houston, not one Southern state uh, put secession to a popular vote, to a referendum. And the reason is that they didn't dare because they knew they would lose. The reason for secession, of course, the main reason, was that they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Well, three quarters of Southern whites didn't own any slaves. And over the population owned a significant number of slaves. The Southerners had no economic interest in the rating. The Confederacy was of the planters, or as Putin might say, um, of oligarchs. It was a fascinating comment from, uh, and, and relative to this idea of such this imbalance in the South between wealthy planters and slaves, and then sort of the mass of poor whites off to the side. A comment from Joseph Brown, who was the governor of Georgia. What Brown said was, the poor man's best government is slavery. The poor man's best government is slavery. Of course, he was talking about the poor white man. And we can understand this comment better if we go back a few years to a guy named Hinton Rowan Helper, who was um, a North Carolinian, he was a son of um, 
a poor farmer, owned a few slaves, not many, and traveled outside the South. He broke through that myopia a little bit, and he saw the light. And the light that he saw was that the story that, that the plantation owners had been telling everyone in the South was false. The story was exactly what Governor Brown said, that slavery was the poor man's best government. Uh, it was good for rich whites, it was good for poor whites, it was good for everybody. What Helper did was he compiled, uh, in effect, an atlas of the Southern. He, he discovered and wrote down in very easy tabular form for everyone to see that um, the whites in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania uh, were better off than the whites in, um, uh, in South Carolina. There was more mobility. They had opportunities. Uh, there was more iron production, more leather. They grew more crops of just about every crop that that battered outside of the cash crops of the South, uh, and that the the story that the plantation owners had been selling them was a lie. He called it a sham democracy, uh, only for the planters. This book made a sensation. It was a bestseller. 40 members of Congress, obviously none of the Southerners endorsed it. Uh, no Southern publisher would touch it. It was banned in, um, in many Southern states. But it raised, you know, it raised a pretty big red flag for the planters if they ever chose to go out on their own. This idea that, that maybe what was in their interest wasn't in the interest of, of poor whites. So here's Governor Brown, as secession's happening, saying slavery is the poor man's best government. At the time, Lincoln and the Republicans were advocating a host of, of things the government could do to help people, social and economic things, like uh, uh, the Homestead Act to give uh, farmers land, like building canals and railroads to improve transportation, like education. Uh, they wanted to build back better, uh, as we would say today. Governor Brown of Georgia said, um, uh, he didn't want all those things the government could bring. All you need, he said, is slavery. He was saying, we'll give the... What? Louder? I start from the beginning? Just kidding. Uh, uh, that better? Okay. I'll try to stay close to it. Um, so Brown is saying, uh, we don't want to give the people all, all these things that the Republicans are promising. Uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll give them, meaning uh, white constituents, a higher rank in the pecking order than, than black slaves. And, and that will be enough. And, and one of his colleagues from Mississippi said, that's right. All we want to do is, is to live sedentary uh, among the reminiscences of the past, he said. Um, if they were, they didn't want progress, all the things Republicans were proposing, because if they, if they adopted, um, if they aspired to progress, they would raise hopes of emancipation. They didn't want that. Back in the 1830s, a politician from, from North Carolina had said that a government that can build canals uh, also emancipate. They couldn't afford that. And just as importantly, they couldn't afford to raise aspirations uh, for poor whites. Way back in 1670, a governor of Virginia had said, I thank God, I thank God that we have no free public schooling in Virginia and we don't have them for a hundred years. Well, here it was 1860, nearly a hundred years later, and his, um, his hope had, had still proven true for, um, for much of the South. You sort of see that, that what divided the North and the South wasn't just slavery. It was slavery, or in the North's case, didn't. They were two civilizations, just, just um, so unlike. The South was a static, unchanging, agrarian, rural, non-industrial, uh, highly unequal in its disbursement of, of wealth. Uh, the North was far more urban. Only about half the people were farmers then, which was, which was quite a change from only 20 years uh, earlier in the North. Uh, they were better educated, its wealth was more evenly distributed, um, and the people there believed in progress. They believed in upward mobility for the commoner. 
And the truest emblem of that belief was Abraham Lincoln. Slavery, just as long as he knew that there was such a thing as slavery, as a young politician, uh, and by the way, he was 51 at the time of secession. As a younger politician, uh, he had made occasional uh, but courageous uh, stands against it. But for most of his early career, slavery was not a big issue, and it wasn't a big issue with Lincoln. Um, the issues that he focused on as a rising uh, aspirant and office holder in Illinois were all economic. Um, and, and these sprung from his uprising, from his upbringing, and his upbringing, of course, as um, once a very poor man. Uh, in 1860, when he was president, he, uh, he did what, what people do today when they aren't president. Uh, they write a campaign biography, or at least they have one written for them, but, but he wrote his own. Uh, gave it to the journalist Scripps, who, who published it. And it focused very much on his upbringing, uh, his years wheel splitting rails, working as what he called a slave for his father. That was the, the word he used. Uh, struggling with um, the muddy roads, driving teams of oxen through, you know, half-drenched, um, uh, ill-paved or, 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 or muddy roads, working in a store that, as he put it, winked out, failed because nobody had any currency in the West because there weren't any banks there. In, in every way, um, here, the, the difficulty that, that he had to get through uh, growing up on the frontier in what was then um, West. For education, he said he'd, he'd gone to school by littles, uh, plural less, by littles, uh, which he met a week here, a few days there, and, and in total, not more than um, uh, when he was 20 or 21, he volunteered for the, the fight in the Black Hawk War. And as he recounted, um, he didn't encounter any hostile Indians, but to his surprise, uh, his mates uh, elected him captain. And um, got back home, uh, his fellows in Springfield urged him to run for, uh, for office, and he ran for state legislature. And uh, on the second try, uh, he was elected. Uh, the, the tale of his is really the tale of an amiable striver who made the most out of uh, very slim opportunities. So many self-made men adopt a philosophy of self-reliance. I can do it, you can do it. And, and, and there was some of that in Lincoln. He said he respected nobody more than the person who brought himself up. Uh, he said it was good that some were rich because it meant that others could become rich. Um, uh, much of his law work, uh, not all of it, much of it was on behalf of, of uh, railroad corporations. Uh, once he was in court uh, representing one of these corporations and the opposing counsel uh, tried to uh, mock him as, as representing a wealthy corporation. And um, Lincoln replied that corporations were but the repository of, of the savings of ordinary people. Um, he didn't engage what could have been a sort of a mean philosophy of, uh, of laissez-faire into a belief, uh, to use one of his wonderful phrases, in a just and generous nation. He believed the government should make opportunity available to others, uh, especially people on the bottom. He thought American democracy could be a, a beacon to the world, precisely for this reason, to enable people to rise up in life, as he had. So the issues that he championed were economic issues. He wanted a, uh, a national bank, which the country hadn't had in, in about 20 years, uh, so that there would be more credit, so that people who own stores um, wouldn't wink out, uh, as he did. He wanted the government to build the canals and uh, railroads. Uh, he was very much in favor of a tariff. And you have to understand that in the goods from England to New York, then from Cincinnati to New York. Uh, so uh, he and many others felt that, that uh, people in the interior of the country really needed help, thus the tariff, thus better transportation. Transportation was a huge, just a huge um, issue if you, were, um, if you were in the interior of the country um, back then. Um, some of these uh, projects uh, took shape in the, the Illinois legislature. 
they approved a whole network of canals and railroads. Unfortunately, they weren't very well financed. Most of them failed. But Lincoln took these issues to the national stage, and some of them did um, uh, get through the Congress. Inevitably vetoed by one Democratic uh, president or ever or other. At the end of the, by the mid uh, 1850s, uh, Lincoln was um, retired from active politics and his party, the Whig party uh, was in shambles. But one issue brought him back and that issue of course was slavery. Um, the slavery, uh, but it's important to remember that they were not abolitionists. Abolitionists could not get elected. Uh, not in New England, and certainly not in Illinois. Uh, whites despised slavery, but, but they despised it from uh, their vantage point as free whites. Uh, they much preferred their own societies to the slave societies in, in Georgia and Louisiana and um, so on. They associated uh, free labor with the greater the North, the more equal dispersion of wealth among whites. Uh, they, they associated um, their free culture with um, the, the, the schools, the churches, the more refined uh, culture of, uh, of New England in the North. They didn't want slavers coming into Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. They didn't want slavery going into the territories, uh, which they expected and wanted to be uh, safety valves. Uh, for um, white workers in the cities and, and immigrants. Uh, but they did not by any means put out a welcome mat uh, for uh, free black Americans uh, to move into their communities. Uh, blacks constituted only 1% of the Northern communities before the Civil War. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the North was very much, most people in the North were very much determined uh, to keep it that way. Uh, racist portrayals of black folk in Northern newspapers were almost as common and almost as unsightly to our eyes as they were in uh, Southern papers. Uh, many Northern states put legal restrictions on blacks. Uh, they couldn't uh, vote in most states. Uh, they couldn't hold uh, various privileges of citizenship, uh, such as uh, jury rights and so on. Uh, many states uh, legally barred them from moving in and taking up uh, residence. And Northern politicians stated clearly uh, that they had no desire uh, for Blacks uh, to move in. Uh, I'll read you a couple of comments because um, you can't do justice to it otherwise. But David Wilmot, who was um, a representative from Pennsylvania and a leader of the uh, anti-slavery movement, meaning stopping the spread of slavery, this is what he had to say uh, about free Blacks. He said this at a public rally. Quote, the Negro race already occupy enough of this fair continent. Let us keep what remains for ourselves and our children for the emigrant that seeks our shores. Uh, Lyman Trumbull, uh, a progressive re uh, Republican from Illinois, friend of Lincoln's was another. Uh, he also endorsed a racially exclusive uh, version of free labor saying, I want to have nothing to do either with the free Negro or the slave Negro. We wish to settle the territories with free white men. Uh, I tell you, this was, was fairly painful when I was reading this in the research. I, I, I expected to run into this. You, know, you, you expect racism in a, in a slave society, which is, which is built on it. Um, but it was particularly painful because there were so few uh, blacks living in the North. Most, most of the whites, most of the people that these politicians were appealing to had never had any dealings with, with a black person. And you sort of wondered where this, um, this racism came from. It was obviously somehow very deep seated. I, I don't have an answer to that question, but it was, it was sort of disturbing. It is disturbing. The politicians who spoke with compassion about um, not just about getting rid of slavery, but with empathy for the slaves uh, themselves. Um, privately, he described his horror at having. Uh, Right, this is right after going south on a riverboat, seeing a chain gang, and he described them in a letter to his sister and a friend, uh, seeing the blacks uh, tied together, as he put it, like fish on a trot line. Uh, and, and he described that they were to be separated, and then he listed them from their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, and all they had dear. 
quickly, he was briefer, but just as eloquent, uh, he said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Um, nonetheless, he tailored his views on race relations to appeal to Northern voters. In his famous debates with uh, Stephen Douglas in 1858, when they were contending for the Senate of Illinois, and when uh, Douglas uh, was quite openly uh, trying to tar Lincoln as a Negro lover, as he put it, Lincoln refused to endorse social equality for the races uh, or voting privileges or equal citizenship. What he did, Lincoln, was to endorse rights for Blacks uh, from an economic angle. Uh, he endorsed his old, old platform of opportunity and extended it to the Black man. In the first Lincoln-Douglas debate, which was in Ottawa, Illinois, in 1858, Lincoln said, in the right to eat the bread without leave of anybody else, which his own hand earns, he, the Black man, is my equal and the equal of Judge Douglas and the equal of every living man. Uh, his idea of equal opportunity, of course, sprang from his credo, a more general credo, that the government's job was to help people to get a foothold in the economic ladder. And he returned to this theme uh, a couple of years later when he was running for president. At this point, he was barnstorming in Connecticut. And he said, we think slavery is morally wrong. We all think it's economic asserting that everyone deserved the chance to rise and pointed the adding, and I believe a black man is entitled to it. To Lincoln, the test of a democracy was economic and he wanted the black man to participate in it. it this was subtle and it was a politically marketable way of uh, acting slavery. It was, it was also rather shrewd because of the black man, and of course I use the term man because that's what was used then, but I mean men and women, if Blacks had the right to market their labor, then they weren't slaves at all. Lincoln's economic program, which was a program of the Republican Party, was a broader version of his argument against slavery. It was a plan for helping all of society, white and Black, to rise. And during the Civil War, uh, when Southerners were absent from the Congress, uh, the Congress passed and Lincoln enacted an astounding array of social and economic legislation that truly transformed uh, the country. These achievements are oddly unknown to the American public. I think most of us know about the New Deal. That's the comparison that's often made when, when Biden has been trying to work on his uh, programs. Uh, but it was the Lincoln government that achieved what Alexander Hamilton had always sought, uh, but, but, but it never happened for the federal government, which is it become uh, uh, a strong force in the economic affairs of the country and an engine of general prosperity and growth. In fact, the, the changes were so revolutionary that an editor in North Carolina uh, called them a new deal. This is at the time, 1860s. So over um, the first half, mostly in the first half of 1862, just a few months, and while they were in the midst of this terrible war, uh, the Congress remade the financial system First off, by creating a new money, which was, was the greenback. And this is just extraordinary to people because it was a paper money that had the legal force of money. And this was actually shocking to people because they had grown up thinking that only um, gold and silver could be money. But the fact was there wasn't enough gold and silver to finance what was rapidly becoming a much wider war. And um, uh, the legislators who approved it were very worried. They were worried that people would uh, reject it, uh, not want to carry it. In fact, it was usually uh, popular with the people. They called them Lincoln dollars, and uh, much to the chagrin of Jefferson Davis, they circulated even in the South. Um, uh, and money that we have today. Another thing they did quite progressively was they instituted the first income tax uh, in the country. And it was a progressive income tax with higher rates uh, according to wealth. And this made a tremendous difference because it gave the North the economic uh, resources uh, to carry on the war, uh, much more than the South had. It created a new banking system, replacing what had been a hodgepodge of, of local state banks, each with their own notes and money, with um, one system of federal banks, uh, all distributing same money. Uh, government created the Department of Agriculture 
uh, to disperse seeds and educate uh, farmers. This was the first government department that took an active hand in private industry. And of course, agriculture was the biggest industry in the culture. I'll just add that um, uh, before then, in the, in the late 1850s, before the war, this idea had been kicking around. And Jefferson Davis, who had been a senator, uh, he scoffed at this idea. He said, um, agriculture needs no teaching by Congress. Well, it didn't if you were Jefferson Davis because Jefferson Davis was given a farm, given a plantation, a cotton plantation by his brother. Uh, so he didn't need anything from Congress. I, I think this, um, this comparison brings out the contrast between North and South. On the one hand, it was good for Jefferson Davis, so it had to be good for everyone else, whether they were given a plantation by their brother or not. On the other hand, the Lincoln is creating a department to, uh, to educate farmers across the land. Uh, they did more. Uh, they passed the Homestead Act uh, to give um, any willing farmer 160 acres, uh, quite an act of, of land reform and redistribution. Um, they passed the Moral Land Grant Act, which is my favorite of all of these, uh, which created a series of colleges for the middle class, uh, which are still running today and still a huge part of our educational system today. I went to Cornell, a land grant college, Mississippi State, later on in the South, Michigan State, Oregon State, across the country. These were colleges um, not teaching uh, theology and Greek like Harvard and Yale did, but they were gonna be colleges of the practical arts for uh, middle-class Americans. Uh, it's really not even most intellectuals of that time went to college. Walt Whitman didn't go to college, Mark Twain didn't go to college, Fewer than 1% of, co of the country went to college. But Lincoln and the Republicans had the idea that, that this should be something the average American should be able to afford. And, um, and they made it happen. And of course, they, they created the, um, the Transcontinental Railroad, which uh, connected the country uh, physically. Uh, it, was, it just had a, a tremendous uh, effect on the, on the psyche of the country. And, and, particularly people wanted to go west. They did other things. Lincoln uh, ushered in an immigration act, the first immigration act to, to encourage immigration, specifically because he wanted people to come and take the places of soldiers uh, who had left for the, for the battlefields, uh, in the fields, in the factories. Uh, they, they, the government got involved in, this, in scientific research for the first time. It got involved in preserving what would become national parks. Uh, it, it, it began to resemble what we know today as the federal government. Today, I think Americans remember that Lincoln had this commitment to the Union, but I'm not sure that we remember uh, the purposes for which he um, insisted on its preservation. Um, but these were so central to him in, in his very first address to the Congress, which was on July 4th, 1861. He called the Congress um, to raise funds and raise troops for the war, he took a moment aside to just remind them why they were fighting. And he said the, um, the leading object of government was the elevation of the condition of men. Anti-slavery, emancipation, and the entire social and economic agenda that I've talked about uh, were the living proof. So the, the North system was not only more modern and more progressive, um, it was a decisive factor in the war. The South held its own in the battlefield for four years. Uh, as late as 1864, which is the fourth year of the war, Grant's army was stuck in the mud, literally in Petersburg. Uh, Lincoln was being told that he had no chance, no chance to win re-election. Uh, there was pressure on him from all sorts of people who thought had been too timid before to give up and sue for peace. Um, there was one front one front where the North was always winning, and that was the financial front. Uh, from 1862 on, if you read the diaries of Southerners, and some of them are quoted in the book, you see them counting the rations they had to eat, the pounds that, that they and their family members were losing, people were suffering for undernourishment. One woman wrote the governor of North Carolina and said, I'd like to know what it is we're fighting for. I think it is for to starve. Uh, because the government had no tax base, and, and the reason the government, the Confederacy had no tax base, uh, 
was it was unwilling to tax the wealthy planters because the government was the wealthy planters. Uh, they requisitioned food from farmers wherever they could find them. And because they were basically stealing crops, uh, farmers hid their crops and hid their uh, livestock. And so there was even scarcer supplies and uh, people went um, hungrier. And um, as soldiers began to hear that their families were going hungry, uh, Southern soldiers, they of course began to desert, uh, first in trickles and then in, um, in waves. In April, 1863, there was a riot in Richmond. This was a riot of uh, mothers and women. Uh, they broke down the doors to the food supplies, to the granaries and bakeries, to uh, break into the supplies of flour that had been sequestered for the troops. Uh, some of them were arrested. Uh, needless to say, uh, people aren't gonna fight very long for government that's putting their mothers or daughters or sisters in the stockade um, and they're hungry. Uh, maybe, maybe something like that is in store for Vladimir Putin uh, if we sanctions long enough. The Confederate, um, their financial failures, especially the willingness, the unwillingness to tax the tax to pay for the war, led to epic inflation, which you may have heard about. Um, if you bought a barrel of flour when the war started in Richmond, it would have cost you five dollars and fifty cents. Uh, by the time of the Richmond food riot, a couple years later, it was $38. It's a pretty big rise. You know, people have gotten upset in this country about a 7% rise. So it went from $5.50 to, to $38. By 1864, uh, flour in Richmond cost $220. And by um, the war's end, it cost a credit or currency, the Confederacy couldn't get arms uh, or spare parts or rolling stock. Uh, the economy broke down. Virtually the only industry they had left was, was printing notes. Uh, it, it, it was a split and, and part of it was on the other side of union forces in, in Texas, but they were so obsessed with printing notes that they shipped the printing press to the Western Confederacy. So the Western Confederacy could continue printing notes. And then in the East, when Richmond was uh, endangered, they shipped a hundred female clerks down to South Carolina to makeshift headquarters so they could go on printing notes. The, the newspapers uh, in, uh, in Richmond were generally pretty easy on the government, but they gave them a pretty tough time over this. And one of them reported that one of the most common sights was to see a Negro slave hauling a wheelbarrow loaded with notes with basically worthless uh, Confederate uh, currency. Uh, who knows what a whole wheelbarrow full of notes um, would have um, would have paid for uh, by that time. And by the, by 1864, uh, schools were paying their teachers in uh, in bacon and cloth. Uh, the money was worthless. As their hopes uh, faded, uh, Southern statesmen repeatedly blamed the government's inept financial program. And they contrasted it to Lincoln and to a secretary of the treasury, big character in the book, Sam and Chase, and their program for financing the war. Southern troops, of course, fought bravely, really magnificently. They fought much larger numbers of Yankees, and they really surprised the North, stunned it by taking the war to the North into Pennsylvania. Uh, but the people had no money, the government had no credit, the budget had no tax base, currency was worthless, as one Confederate leader said, the Yankees didn't whip us in the field, we were whipped in the Treasury Department. The Confederacy uh, really put more than slavery on the line by fighting this war. They put an entire civilization, a rural, agrarian, backward, pre-financial, highly decentralized, restrictive in the extreme towards uh, central government, dependent on black slave labor, and highly unequal uh, in its wealth distribution among whites, they put that whole civilization on the line. And the Union was very much appreciated. Well, sign some books outside. <laughs>
Sure, sure, sure. I, you know, sure, absolutely. Yes, uh, Jimmy. Thank you very much for, for this. All slavery. Why didn't we fight for the union? Why didn't we just let them go? Like I look at today. Very, it's, it's 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 a very good question, and I I think the point about not um, fighting to abolish slavery needs a little elaboration. It's it's true. Uh, yeah, the, the, the question is why um, why since we weren't fighting, we the North weren't fighting to abolish slavery. Why did we fight? Uh, and Lincoln had one purpose, and that was to reestablish the Union. And when he was pushed to do more for the slaves, he said, um, he said, if I can uh, conquer the South or protect the Constitution by freeing no slaves, I'll do it. If I can do it by freeing all slaves, I'll do it. And if I can do it by freeing uh, some slaves, not others, I'll do it. Um, and that that calculus evolved as the war went on. Uh, about a year into the war, a Southerner suggested to him, wrote him, that if he would only take the South back uh, as they were, meaning with slavery intact, uh, you know, maybe this whole Civil War thing could be given up. And Lincoln re responded with uncharacteristic irritation. He said, um, broken eggs cannot be mended. Um, of course, uh, some months later, he promulgated the Emancipation Proclamation. Even that was as an act of war. Anyone who was not in rebellion were, were affected. He even said to the states under rebellion that if you came back to the Union, the Emancipation Proclamation wouldn't affect you. But the more the war went on, the more emancipation became uh, part of his purpose. Uh, he said when he signed the proclamation that um, my name goes into the history books it will be for this act. And as the war went on and he was approached at various points about peace treaty, his response was always, uh, only if the South rejoins the North and obeys all laws of the United States, the constitution, including the Emancipation Proclamation. So the slavery, the causes of the North evolved, I think, to, uh, to encompass that. The South was the other way. They were, um, they seceded, uh, Preserving slavery was their, was their main goal. Of course, it had the opposite effect. The more they fought, the uh, more investment they had in this supposed nation they had built up. And towards the end of the war, they, they um, contemplated uh, freeing their slaves so that they could go fight. And it was obvious to them that slavery wasn't going to last anyway. So many of their slaves were freeing. But they now had a stake in the other cause, in independence. So your question was, why at the start? Um, Lincoln believed that tremendous faith in American democracy and um, would survive in any meaningful way if it were disintegrated. It wasn't only the South that could leave. Uh, you know, New York was flirting with becoming, with New York City with becoming a neutral state as the war broke out so they could trade with both the North and South. There were fears that California would uh, break away Federation uh, was not the fate of all nations. The German states weren't unified. Italy wasn't unified. Um, things I think like patriotism and the flag were seriously. And Lincoln was very clever. He, he was the one who fought the war by sending uh, a squadron to Fort Sumter, but he didn't fire. And he let the first shots come from the South. At that point, it was, it was a question of honor. Uh, we'd been fired upon and overnight the north had, the, the northern public had been pretty much opposed to even sending a fleet to fort sumter uh horace greeley the most famous journalist in america said Aryan sisters go in peace but from the moment the north was fired on uh the mood changed pro-southern suddenly began uh, forming regiments and um I, I think part of it was this 19th century uh, concept of honor and patriotism, and, and part of it was a real belief in the union as a union. So there's a question online that says, please talk a little bit about the shock aspect of introducing paper money. What did the union government have to overcome that shock? 
what are the pragmatic steps? Did the union start by paying federal government employees and paper money? Did the union- There's a lot of echo. Can you repeat the question? Um, so the question is, what, what about this uh, shock? What did the, uh, the government have to do to overcome it? Um, they, they did um, pay uh, federal officials uh, in greenbacks uh, as, they, as they became, the current greenback, by the way, just, just arose uh, uh, colloquially, but, but, but pretty quickly they were called greenbacks, sometimes uh, Lincoln dollars. Uh, Lincoln was paid in greenbacks, uh, Salmon Chase was. Um, contractors were paid in greenbacks. It was the expectation of the government that um, as uh, the money began to circulate, uh, people would use these notes and buy government bonds so that the greenbacks would go back to the government and they could, they could reissue them because there was only a limited number. The issue, the first issue was 150 million. That was all Congress issued. But in fact, um, uh, that's them. Uh, they carried them around. They found them very useful. Uh, they liked them. Uh, they believed in them. Uh, and the contractors the government paid didn't, didn't really have much choice. They could take a government credit, but that really wasn't much a better. Greenbacks were something you could take and spend right away. Uh, unlike uh, the, the government was giving out a one-year paper, uh, you know, if, if they owed you, which they, they owed a lot of contractors for all the things they were purchasing. So rather than take this piece of paper uh, that paid a little a bit of interest uh, and, and you could get this greenback that didn't pay any interest, but, but guess what? It was money and everybody had to take it because the, um, uh, the law said it was money. It, it was this aspect that was so controversial because it, the, the fact that it was compulsory because it meant that if you had borrowed money in gold, uh, then when greenbacks came along, you could pay it back in paper. And this seemed just absolutely unfair to people. But um, in fact, the people accepted it um, remarkably well. They traded a discount to gold. So if you, um, if you wanted to buy you know, an ounce or whatever of gold, you had to buy, you had to pay in the beginning about 102 uh, cents in greenbacks. And that disparity widened as the war went on and it widened very much as um, uh, and when the unions uh, military, it, it, it seemed to vary more with military fortunes than, than with the printing of money. The, the, the union did one other thing to limit inflation. Uh, which was it limited the, the expense, the, the amount of greenbacks, the total of greenbacks of this new money only amounted to about a sixth of the war debt, one sixth, which is pretty restrained. So the total uh, in, inflation in the greenback over the course of the war uh, was about 80%. Now that's a lot, you know, think of how that would feel now. It was a hardship, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't any more than we experienced in World War I or World War II. Uh, you're going to have inflation when you have wars because demand goes up. And that 80% was considerably less than the 9,000% experienced in the Confederacy. On the topic, because uh, previous I'd written a book about the creation of the Federal Reserve and the Fed replaced the system that the Secretary of the Treasury, Simon Chase, Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury had set up. I got kind of interested in the fact that in the middle of the Civil War, they had taken the time to set up this whole new financial system. And then I saw that done all these other things. And so I kind of got hooked. Um, and um, you know, the research was from, was from archives and, um, and Widener Library and um, the Library of Congress and various other libraries. Um, you, know, I, you couldn't really interview anybody. Um, <laughs> the, the hardest thing for me is um, the letters. Uh, you know, there, there are tons of letters that survive, but, but they're all in cursive. And um, you know, some of them yeah, very well. I, I, I found it uh, really hard. If you get to someone like Lincoln, uh, his letters are all published, of course, but it's surprising that even, um, you know, even somebody like Jay Cook you know, a very famous financier, just a small portion of their letters are actually published. The rest you have to uh, do a lot of squinting. 
question is, to what extent uh, did the union blockade of southern ports undercut the southern economy? To every extent. In the beginning, uh, Lincoln announced this blockade and it wasn't effective. There were 3,500 miles of coastline. The Union had a very small Navy and uh, the South was pretty clever. Um, they they uh, built these very fast runners that would go from ports in the South like Charleston and New Orleans uh, to various Caribbean islands. Um, uh, and the islands served as depots. And then once, once they got there, they would offload these goods into um, ocean going vessels flying under usually the British flag. So uh, at that point it was, it was safe. You just had to get uh, from one of these islands to, to some port in the South. There are a lot of islands, a lot of ports in the South. And the adventurers who, uh, buccaneer types and so on, who chartered these ships uh, made tremendous profits. Of course, every so often a ship went down and was captured. But in the beginning, the, the capture rate was something like a sixth or a seventh. There are no official figures, but those are, it's probably uh, pretty good. Um, and they were mostly private enterprise. You know, so uh, the Jefferson Davis would would commission the, the the captains to take what they wanted, but the, the the captains were were independent agents. They could do what they want. But as the war went on, uh, the Union Navy grew, and its effectiveness grew, and it began to track these guys down, and um, uh, you know, by the end, the South was slowly starving because they couldn't get cotton out and that meant they couldn't get arms or anything else in and it had a, a tremendous effect. And there's a, there's a scene in the book when uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, the last port uh, of the South is captured and, and um, uh, one of the Southern leaders says, well, uh, maybe we should switch to manufacturing. It was just you know, complete, you know, Alice in Wonderland stuff at this point. <laughs> there's, Late for that, but but it was it was very consequential. Thank you. Thank you.